thank you. Yes. So now it's our session, Research Area 5, Historic to Millennium Climate Variability. My name is Chung Zhang, and I'm the colleague together with Marlene Schlender. Unfortunately, she had some uh, small bicycle accident and can't join us this afternoon. Uh, so in Research Area 5, our mission is we look at the climate variability on historic and the millennium time scale. It's not that deep like I 6 but it's still the pale climate. And what we do is we use this um, nature archive to reconstruct the past climate. And we also use the climate model to simulate the past climate because we think it's uh, a good text bed for the climate model that is used for the future projections. In this case, we also do this model data comparisons. And uh, then we also collaborate with people in mathematics depart department to have good uh, statistical methods to do the model data comparison. <laughs> Uh, this is just a small overview for our activities in 2017. So this year we see, uh, we support uh, like eight small projects. Uh, three projects will be presented today in the uh, in different talks. And we also organize workshops, uh, meetings. Uh, this year we had this very big uh, PMA climate model in the comparison uh, conference here just uh, in happened in September. We had 160 participants from 24 countries come here. Over 20 model modeling group joined the meeting. And we also have one um, workshop that on this uh, climate and land use changes on access to the Arctic Sweden, organized by Minis. Um, so we also use our fund to support individual scientists to go to AGU, EGU, or small specialized workshops. And we will continue to do this in next year, so we will have these funding applications in next March for next year's uh, support. And we also have our own piece of lunch, this kind of activities within the IA5. And next year, there will be another very big conference, these uh, meetings, these IPA, IAL joint meetings on, on revealing the past and the future of the lakes in June, also in Stockholm University. <coughs> so today, we have four uh, talks mostly also initiated within this IA5 fund. Then uh, I think now we start our talk. First will be Frederick. I think you can Thank you so much. I'm going to briefly present an ongoing project that were kicked off exactly, almost exactly one year ago on a workshop here at the Berlin Center that I arranged. And uh, of this project that is now in the stage of an almost finished first draft. And some, I mean, the results will change slightly and be improved in the details. But I think the major conclusions will be still standing. And the project is about comparing summer temperature and summer hydroclimate co-variability at various time scales in Europe. And it's both from instrumental data for the last few centuries, tree ring based reconstructions and high resolution climate model simulations. And the reason for doing this is that we know very well that changes in the hydrological cycle and maybe an increasing risk for droughts in parts of Europe under global warming is a major risk for agriculture and many other sectors of society. On the same time, we know very well that the climate models of today are very bad in simulating changes in hydroclimate. In hydro they often get hydroclimate wrong. We also know that the covariability between temperature and hydroclimate is highly time scale dependent. We have one type of covariability, different areas on interannual time scales, maybe up to decale, but on the low frequency, it can be very different on long term scales, even the opposite sign. And research done in monsoon Asia shows that whereas you have a negative relationship between temperature and precipitation on interannual time scales, on centennial to millennium time scale, you have a positive relationship. We wanted to investigate this for Europe. We have new possibilities to do so. 
thanks to two gridded high resolution tree ring based products a, a temperature atlas and a drought atlas and for the purpose of this project we updated both pro uh, both products so they are totally independent in terms of predictors from each other and we also improve them and extend them towards the present uh, so the data we look at is the high resolution instrumental data from crew. We also look at early instrumental data from the late 18th century and covering the 19th century as independent verification. And also these two updated tree ring based products, one for summer drought and one for summer temperature. And then we selected the two CMIP-5 climate models with the highest resolution possible because to simulate hydroclimate well, you need high resolution in the models. So we selected these two models also. And what we do is to compare the spatial covariability between summer temperature and hydroclimate at different timescales from interannual up to centennial. Obviously, you can't have centennial timescales in instrumental data. It's simply too short. But for the reconstructions and the models, we can have it. And we look at the cross correlations. We look at the distributions of correlations to see detect dipole patterns, for example. We also look at the spectral patterns in different subregions. And also the spectral agreements, so to say, or spectral peaks in higher climate and temperature and lags and leads. And finally, we conduct a cluster analysis of the data sets. And I will show you some preliminary results, so not that preliminary. If you look at precipitation in the 20th century and look at the high pass filter data that only preserves uh, variabilities on time scales short than 20 years, we see a negative and significantly negative correlation basically everywhere. When it gets warmer in summer, you get less precipitation. But if you go down to decayal time scale, we see a slightly different pattern. You don't see it really, really well here in the colors, but many boxes are simply not significant. <coughs> uh, and we see also large areas in northern Europe and some in southern Europe with a positive relationship not seen on interannual time scales. If we go to the reconstructions, we see this pattern too. Uh, very weak correlations, more negative, but also large areas in Northern Europe with quite positive uh, uh, correlation patterns. Are, and this I will come back to because this is slightly biased towards the positive. But we look at the model simulations. We don't need to bother much which model we look at. We see, okay, negative like in instrumental data, basically everywhere on all... It doesn't matter which sub-period you select. If you select, say, only 20 century or full length, etc., you see this pattern of basically negative everywhere on, in the high frequency. And under the kill time scale, we see basically the same pattern in the models. And this is, even if you look at a 20 century, instrumental data show more positive correlations on longer time scales and also change in correlation strength. You don't see it in the models. But, however, if you look at different subregions, you see the same spectral peaks, especially about 64 years and 130 years and so, in both the reconstructions and in the simulations and the shorter spectral peaks that you can detect also in instrumental data. And the, and the cross wavelet analysis also show basically the same spectral peaks in all both models, reconstructions and instrumental data, which I infer like there's some external forcing or internal modes of variability that actually uh, is present both in simulations and real world climate, although we have dif very different, even the sign is different in the correlations. And the conclusion so far from this is that, of course, the co variability between summer temperature and summer drought indeed change with time scale and it also looks different in different parts of Europe that we could expect. What is more interesting is that the distribution of the covariability of the correlations between temperature and hydroclimate becomes much stronger 
and much more positive at longer timescales, both in instrumental data and in reconstructions, but not in the models. That's an important difference. And the simulations show a stronger negative relationship between temperature and hydroclimate than seen either in instrumental data or in reconstructions. But the reconstructions, on the other hand, obviously show a too positive correlation. So in the models, it's too negative between temperature and hydroclimate, regardless if you look at PDSI, a drought index, or direct precipitation. The models are too negatively biased. When it gets warmer on all times, it gets drier in Europe in summer. But the tree ring based products show a too positive relationship instead. The instrumental shows something in between. And this is actually quite expected also because tree growth is affected in most of Europe, both by the availability of water and the temperature. So if it's both wet and warm, most trees would grow pretty well. But if it's cold and dry, they will grow bad. So the tree growth will be affected by both variables and therefore have a biased positive correlation because they can't separate precipitation and temperature falling. And no, basically no tree ring record in these large scale products is only a, a pure temperature proxy or a pure hydroclimate proxy. There can be that the most of the information is from temperature or hydroclimate, but it's always some shared information, which will lead, it's even expected to lead to this positive bias, and that's important to remember. But still so, we see these spectral peaks being the same in the models, the instrumental data, and in the tree ring based reconstructions, which indicates that even if the models have a too negative relationship, and the tree ring reconstructions instead a too positive relationship between temperature and hydroclimate in the summer, they still show the same, uh, the same periods and reflect possibly the same forcing or the same internal modes of variability. And we will look into this in the coming few months. I'm working on this right now to really look at the differences between the distribution and also see the presence of dipoles and if this differs between, for example, models and reconstructions. And really try to explain the reason why is the models too negative and the tree ring reconstructions too positive, because this is a very important question, because this basically limits our understanding of the hydroclimate prior to, say, the late 18th century or so, when we don't have any instrumental data to look at the real low frequency covariability. We can't look at anything else than either fully forced climate model simulations or basically tree ring based reconstructions and also other type of proxies either are biased towards other seasons or have dating uncertainties or don't cover I mean, all frequency spectrums. So this tree ring based product is the best we have right now and this seems to be too biased to the positive and the model is too negative. I can't repeat it enough because we, that means that we don't have any really good independent data to go beyond the instrumental data that don't have a bias in either direction. So the really true relationship on longer timescales is still unknown. And that of course have implications for what happens in a warmer future climate with higher climate. Thank you so much. Hey, um, can you explain the cross wavelet uh, graph that you showed before your conclusions? Because it looks so fancy. It's basic to show with these arrows up here, arrows, if it's lead or lag, and if you have the same spectral peaks at the same time. So if you have I mean, a, say a cycle of 70 years, if it occurs at the same time, or if it's a lead or lag in temperature versus say, precipitation. Yeah, this model by was, was interesting. Uh, have you had any preliminary thoughts about why that happened? And also, the implications, the uh, drying of Central and Southern Europe is implicated for the future. Is that too dramatic, do you think? 
maybe, maybe not. It's very hard to assess. It has been shown in numerous earlier studies, especially for Asia, this two negative relationship. It's a problem with cloud cover. It's a problem also with soil moisture and vegetation in the models. And it's also that there seems to be too strongly coupled between temperature and changes in the hydrological cycles and less internal variability on longer timescales than in real world climate. I published a year and a half ago a nature paper looking at the last millennium in the whole northern hemisphere and we found basically, okay, you find much agreement between the moles and the reconstructions, but the fall of temperature too closely and all the overestimates increase of extremes in hydroclimate in the 20th century when the temperature goes up. It's basically that it seems to be more internal variability, difficulties with the simulating the cloud cover correctly, soil moisture, vegetation feedbacks, and also that they are too zonal, the models, because of the size of the grid cells. I mean, downscaling, you get slightly better results, and it also differs much between models. You can even see that the MPI model gets the modern climatology wrong. It gets too much precipitation in Europe, for example. When the CCSM4 is better. So just adding to that then, you said you used two models and you yes. chose them because they had the finest resolution. Yes, that was basically, when we worked on this workshop, see which models have the chance to make the best job. And we also compared them between the 20, late 20th century climatology, 1950 to 2010, I think, or 2003, with actually high resolution instrumental data. Who gets the precipitation best? They actually observed. Yeah. Say maybe there are other models that, that could represent the observables better, but no. Okay. I can't. Uh, any questions? Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Plick. I'm a PhD student at the Department of Physical Geography, and I'm going to tell you a bit about what I've been working on recently, which is basically what it says here, last interglacial temperature variability in northern Fenoscandia, insights from subfossil pyramids. So, as we are now, approximately 11,000 years into the present interglacial, it is becoming increasing, increasingly obvious that we humans are affecting our climate with a prospected uh, warming of at least two degrees in the coming century. Uh, being more pronounced in the Arctic areas. Uh, well, facing these facts, it's becoming also increasingly interesting to turn our eyes towards past periods of globally warm conditions, such as the last interglacial, uh, both to study climate dynamics in a warmer than present world, and also to study the natural development, development of an interglacial. What started it? Uh, how dynamic was it? How stable was it? And maybe most interestingly, what led to the end of it, what processes and feedbacks caused the onset again of glacial conditions. So the last interglacial is also called the Eemian or Marine Isotope Stage 5E. It's dated to approximately 130 to 115,000 years ago. Uh, during this period, global temperatures were approximately 1.5 to 2 degrees above present. And in the Arctic, upland temperatures were even higher, approximately 4 to 5 degrees above present. Uh, and global sea levels were 6 to 9 meters above present, indicating some substantial contribution from the Greenland ice sheet and the, possibly also the Western Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere were close to or similar to pre-industrial levels. Uh, but um, insulation was higher during the 
uh, immune integration and holocene integration due to a different configuration of the orbital parameters. So there are some uh, key limitations to studying the immune. This is uh, uh, one of these are the lack of absolute dating methods uh, for most records. Uh, this is beyond the reach of radiocarbon chronology uh, or radiocarbon dating. Uh, so many records rely on tuning to orbital uh, parameters or to on modeling or uh, aligning one record to another record where you have a, where you suppose a synchronous regional expression of an event that is dated in that record. There's also a lack of spatial distribution if you of the records. If you look at it from a European perspective, there's a lack of high latitude data due to extensive glacial erosion during the glacial period that followed the last interglacial. Uh, and this uh, is especially problematic since the high latitude uh, marine records are influenced by meltwater input uh, that can uh, bias some of the stratigraphical um, data that could be used for tying these records to records outside the region. And this has led to some uh, model and uh, proxy data inconsistencies, especially in high latitude northern areas in the, during the early Eemian, and also uh, ongoing discussion about the synchronicity or on, asynchronicity in the onset and end of the Eemian. There's now uh, sort of a consensus that the Eemian in northern Europe was shorter than the Eemian in southern Europe, uh, mainly because of an earlier demise of lost interglacial, or of interglacial conditions. Uh, yeah, and in, in the Nordic seas, it has been suggested that uh, interglacial conditions were reached late in the interglacial, approximately 5,000 years after interglacial conditions were reached in other parts of the world. And recently, it has been suggested that this also affected Fenoscandia and temperatures from terrestrial records. Uh, this is a record based on Chironomids in uh, Denmark, uh, temperature, and it shows that uh, low temperatures during the first 3,000 years of the interglacial, when uh, temperatures in um, more southerly areas or the rest of Europe were actually optimum, <laughs> at the optimum. So I work at a site in northern Finland, it's called Sotli. Uh, it's an interesting site because it contains a long and continuous a uh, well-preserved sediment sequence from the Indian, even though it's situated in a previously glaciated area. It's also interesting because it is a high latitude site, so it uh, can be expected to respond sensitively to changes uh, to climatic uh, processes occurring in high latitudes, such as changes in the extent of sea ice, or movements of the polar and arctic fronts, or changes in the ocean circulation. We are several people working on this site. We have a multi-proxy multi approach to reconstructions is based on the transfer function approach, which we apply to pollen and chironomids. And I work on the chironomids. And this is sort of an internal validation when you reconstruct the same parameter uh, by using different proxies. Yeah. So uh, the pollen based reconstruction and the chironomy based reconstruction, this is from Sotli, uh, show many similarities, uh, both in absolute temperature and in the temperature trends, lending some support to our reconstruction. Uh, this part of the chironomy record, we believe, are uh, affected by some other factors, uh, uh, other factor of influencing the temperature record. So it, we trust more the pollen reconstruction in this part. That's why it's uh, hatched. Uh, and that uh, the pollen record shows a slightly decreasing temperature trend here. So generally, we reconstruct uh, temperatures 1 to 2 degrees above present throughout the interglacial. And this is similar to uh, records from Europe and from uh, the subpolar North Atlantic, uh, like this one. Uh, but it differs quite substantially from other high latitude records, which reconstruct warmer uh, optimum temperatures. 
we see a cooling trend towards the end of the Ingen, but most importantly, maybe we see uh, warm conditions during the early part of the interlation. And this is also similar to records from Northern Europe and Central Europe, and also records from subpolar North Atlantic and also from the North Atlantic. But it differs from the record from Denmark, it shows uh, two to seven degrees cooler temperatures during this early part of the interglacial. Uh, it needs to be realized that this record is based on chironomids also, and chironomids have sh shown to be able to respond also to other factors than temperature, and you need to evaluate your record carefully, <laughs> or your reconstruction carefully. And the uh, pollen uh, records from this site also show that during this time, this, the area was covered by dense deciduous forests, similar to the optimum climate forests of northern Germany. So we suggest that this <laughs> early part of the union was, in fact, warm also in Fenoscandia. Um, and then, uh, if we look at the Sotli record again, it seems quite spiky. And this is uh, both uh, because of natural variability and also in this uh, part there is a bit lower resolution of the sample spectral cost diffs. But when we compare with uh, pollen and other proxy data from this site, and also the Tyronid data, we pick up uh, two events, one in the early part of the interglacial and one in the late part of the interglacial. And though uh, we can only speculate about how these correlate to other records from the region and from events seen there, we, due to this uh, uncertain, uncertainty in chronologies, we still see similar events during the early and late part of the Emian, uh, uh, especially from high latitude records. And these, in these records, uh, marine records, these events have been related to meltwater input from the Greenland ice sheet, uh, causing a breakdown of the thermaline circulation that brings uh, warmth up to higher northern latitudes. So in that matter, it's only reasonable that uh, terrestrial rec records from this area should pick up these events also. Yeah, yeah. That was it. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
Okay, um, hello everyone. So in uh, this study on uh, Holocene peatland development in northern Norway, I will present the results of two master theses performed at the Department of Physical Geography in collaboration with the University of Oslo. And um, the environment that's in focus during this presentation are permafrost peatlands. Um, and permafrost peatlands are characterized by um, thick organic deposits that are uplifted above the surrounding wetlands by frost heave in subarctic areas. And uh, they contain quite a complex um, landscape mosaic. So in this picture, you can actually see um, these areas representing peat plateaus, quite dry areas with dwarf shrub vegetation. They can cover extensive areas. But within these landscapes, you also find depression where, um, or depressions where the permafrost has thawed. And in these depressions, fens or lakes can be found. So that's the type of landscape we're talking about. Why should we care about these environments? Well, for a number of reasons, of course, but may, maybe this is one of the most important ones. If we look at the map um, on the left here, it shows the soil types throughout the Circum Arctic. Um, and I've highlighted with red circles areas where histosols, organic soils, or peatlands are really, really extensive. So in Hudson Bay lowlands and along the Mackenzie River in Canada, um, peatlands cover vast areas. And also, you can see extensive peatland areas in West Siberia lowlands in Russia. If we also look at the map on the right here, um, showing the soil organic carbon in the soil down to three meters depth, we can see that these regions are actually hotspots for finding soil organic carbon. So in these regions, we have carbon storages of more than 100 kilograms uh, carbon per square meter. So even though these areas only cover a little more than 5% of the land in the permafrost region, the, the soil organic carbon content is, is around a quarter of what is found in the entire permafrost region. So very carbon rich soils. Um, the objectives then of this particular study, well, there were a number of objectives. The first one was to increase our understanding of Holocene uh, subarctic peatland um, development in general and um, the permafrost dynamics in particular. The other aim or objective was to better understand um, long-term carbon dynamics in these environments in relation to vegetation and permafrost conditions in order to better be able to predict um, future permafrost carbon feedbacks from these ecosystems. Study sites, well, we went up to northernmost Norway, to the county of Finnmark, around 70 degrees north. Um, and here, well, you can see on the map on the right-hand side, um, these blue areas show where permafrost peatlands occur. So quite a lot of permafrost peatlands uh, in the continental areas close to the Finnish border. If you have really good uh, eyesight, you may be able to spot some small black, or, sorry, blue dots, also closer to the coast, representing permafrost peatlands. Um, so we picked four study sites, two coastal sites, and two continental sites for this study. And this is what the sites look like in the field. Um, September last year, 2017, so we have the two continental sites at slightly higher elevation on top, and we have the coastal sites at lower elevation at the bottom here. Uh, but if you look just generally at these pictures, you can see they look fairly similar. So it's a typical permafrost peatland, peat plateau, um, at all these four sites, looking really similar. Um, you also see these depressions that I was talking about here, for example, in here and here. Um, depressions where the permafrost has thawed and where fen, fens are now um, taking over the vegetation. But at the surface on the peat plateau, it's mainly dwarf shrub vegetation, as you can see. And here we're trying to collect samples. Well, we're not just trying, we are collecting samples to take back. Um, and in the active layer, which is the upper layer of the peat soils that thaws in the summer, there we can actually cut out blocks of peat uh, using a saw. But once we hit the permafrost, the permafrost is hard and frozen, so we have to change sampling technique and hammer down steel pipes with a sledgehammer and then squeeze out the, the center um, where the material is caught. And maybe you can see also here, if you have really good, well, I don't know, 
some uh, white patches here, and that's ice, very ice-rich peat sediments. So all these samples from these four sites we took back to the lab for analysis. And the most time-consuming analysis is the plant macrofossil analysis, looking in detail at the botanical composition of the different peat layers throughout the peat stratigraphies. Uh, and the reason why we're interested in this is because we want to be able to infer when did, well, we want to know the peatland development, but we also want to know when did permafrost form in these peatlands. Uh, we've also done a number of geochemical analysis bulk density, loss on ignition, carbon and nitrogen content, and CNN stable isotopes. And of course, also AMS radiocarbon dating, since it's important to know uh, when did the peatlands form, but also when did we have shifts in the botanical composition indicating uh, permafrost aggradation. So jumping to some of the results, um, I'm not going to go into these in great detail, but for all the four sites, we have detailed plant macrofossil data presented in graphs like this. Um, I just picked one of the sites, Karlebotten, one of the coastal sites. And as I said, I won't talk about it in great detail, but just highlight three zones. And this is characteristic, really, for all four sites. We found these um, three zones. The lowermost being zone one, well, not even zone one, so zero uh, is actually not even in the peat. It's the mineralogenic sediments below. So it's silty, sandy sediments below the organic sediments, not really containing um, very much of macrofossils. So the, the main zone, both in depth and in time, is, is this one that's highlighted here. And that's the fen stage of this wetland. Uh, so at this particular site, uh, the peat initiation was around 5,200 Callier BP, and the fen stage then uh, extended up until a little after 1,000 Callier BP. And looking at the botanical composition, so the characteristic plant species here are uh, mosses growing in wet fen environments, also um, remnants of cyperaceae, so seeds of cyperaceae, but also Menianthus and Potentilla and other species that occur uh, under wet fen conditions in wetlands. Um, so around or just after 1,000 Callier BP, there is actually a shift in the botanical composition. So we lose all the cyperaceae, uh, indicative of wet environments, and instead, um, other species or features start appearing. So we have a lot of dark roots from the uh, dwarf shrub community, but also uh, mosses like Dicranum and Sphagnum fuscum that grow in drier environments. So this shift um, in, in, um, in plants really tell us that something happened, and we conclude then that this must be when permafrost aggradation took place and the frost heave occurred, causing drier conditions at the surface. Um, but we also use the geochemistry um, to try to, to help us identify when permafrost formed and to see if that fits then with the macrofossil results. Um, and this is, um, um, so to identify peak perturbation indicative of permafrost aggradation, we have used um, a relationship between the carbon nitrogen ratio and the delta 15 N values. So, um, so this is a theoretical relationship. And we plotted all our samples or our data from all four sides in this graph. Um, and everything that falls within these dotted lines, which represent an uncertainty envelope of 2.4 per mil, all of that is considered to be unperturbed samples. But samples that fall outside of this uncertainty envelope, they are indicative of, of perturbation, suggesting that these uh, samples are actually um, indicating then permafrost conditions. And if we plot these against ages for the different sites, we can see that fortunately these end up at the top during the last 1,000 years when also the macrofossils suggest that this is when permafrost aggradation took place. So supporting um, our interpretation from the plant macrofossils. And quickly jumping also to conclusions, I haven't talked so much about the radiocarbon dating uh, but there are some differences between the sites. So the continental sites uh, appear to have formed 
a little earlier, or the peat started forming a little earlier at the continental sites, between 9 and 10,000 Calier BP. At the coastal sites at lower elevation, uh, peat initiation started a few thousand years later. Partly, this can be explained by the fact that during the early Holocene, um, these sites at low elevation were inundated by water because they're close to the coast. Now I'm going to jump to the third point just to see if you're awake. Um, so we'll go into the permafrost development, uh, and that took place during the Little Ice Age at all four sites. A little earlier at two of the sites and a little later, but still within um, at two other sites, but within the Little Ice Age period. If we look at the carbon that I said was really important but haven't talked so much about, I will um, talk a little bit about that now. So the mean uh, carbon accumulation rate um, throughout the Holocene at all these four sites was 12 grams of carbon per square meter in year. And this um, fits quite well with a few previous studies that exist from this region. Uh, also, the mean carbon storage, it was a little below 100 kilograms per square meter uh, at the two coastal sites, which were more shallow and younger but over 100 kilograms of carbon at the continental sites that were deeper and older, so that makes sense. Uh, and finally, so all of this carbon that has been stored over long time periods, it's, it's sitting there in the soil, and in a future warmer climate, uh, there is, of course, a potential risk that some of this carbon will actually become available for decomposition and contribute to, um, to uh, emissions of greenhouse gases and further global warming. And with that, um, I would like to thank for your attention, and I would also like to strongly promote uh, a poster this afternoon, where you will get even more information um, by, by uh, one of the master students, so that's Sophia sitting on the left, she's also sitting in the audience here, she will present a lot more and be able to discuss a lot more um, if you can't get your answers here. So, thank you. Question about the sampling, and uh, you have four sites. Let's assume you have uh, time and uh, possibility to more sites. Let's say twenty. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> yes. Do we expect some difference? In um, other words, what is the homogeneity or inhomogeneity of your? No, sites? Of, of course that's a very good question. I mean, having just one core per study site, how representative is that? Um, and, and of course, that actually could be one of the reasons also why um, why we get, to, for example, like here we get different timing for the permafrost aggregation um, or different ages also for the peatlands. I mean, of course, you have when a peatland starts forming or where permafrost starts forming, it starts forming in one area and then it sort of spreads and, and uh, moves vertically. But so, so it depends then, of course, if you've been coring in one area or another area. Um, so it affects definitely the dates and so on. Um, now I'm forgetting what was the question. So, if it, well, of course it has an impact on the results. Uh, the fact that we have few uh, or just one sample per site. There could be variability within uh, the peatlands, both for peat initiation but also for permafrost degradation. And, and uh, just looking at what these um, areas look like today, you have a variability of, of dry surfaces but you also have wet surfaces. So, of course, that I mean, if you core just 10 meters away, you could get a different result. But it's 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 surprisingly consistent between these four study sites, I would say. So that at least tells us something that we're probably catching some of the general um, variability. Yeah. Yeah. For the for the permafrost at uh, at Loch Selv and Swosi uh, uh, if it only started forming 100 years ago, uh, uh, you can't have formed all that much permafrost. I was wondering, you know, uh, how, lo how long would it take to, to get rid of that permafrost? What's the natural time constant? How long does it take to get rid of that permafrost, even if you discount the effect of, of global warming? It seems like that should have been gone already before you're very far into the 20th century. Yeah. I I didn't really have time to, to in detail go into this, so, so I put this around 100 calier BP. But this is also, I would like to stress, this is a minimum age for the permafrost degradation. 
in this course, um, we actually had a lot of just fluffy material that was impossible to find anything to date for, for quite a few centimeters. So, so this is really a minimum age. We expect permafrost aggradation to have been earlier also at these sites. Um, but, but of course, we don't have any data for that. So, so uh, um, but yeah, that's, I don't know if that would answer your question either. So to disappear, I mean, it's certainly it's thawing. All, all ground temperatures at all these sites are very close to zero degrees. So um, they're all thawing, but it's a slow process. I guess I'll just get what, what, how many meters per year, or how many centimeters per year of thermofrost, of thermofrost do you lose if you have a certain change of temperature? Mm -hmm. How long does it take to lose the thermofrost? What's the time delay in the system? Well, I mean, you have, um, you have, it works from two ways. So it works yeah. both from the surface and from below. So what you have is deepening of the active layer that could, but that that's really variable from year to year. It very much depends on on the summer conditions and summer temperatures. Uh, so so it can actually yeah be deeper one year and more shallow the next year if you have a warm summer or sorry if you have a cold summer it will be more shallow. Uh, but then you also have the thawing from below. So um, um, well it's it's hard to say in year. I mean and you have also a warming of the permafrost itself, which is really slow once you start getting close to zero degrees because then you have the, the phase transition um, yeah ne needing a lot of energy. So that's really another topic, but I, I'm very interested in that too. <laughs> just just a quick uh, question f uh, along the same lines. I'm a little puzzled that you that it started a thousand years ago because then we're in the medieval climate anomaly. It should have been warmer. Why did why didn't it start in the real Little Ice Age? Well, um, what we've done is we have dated um, organic matter from from the lowermost part of this uh, upper layer where we have this uh, dry rootlet type of peat. Um, yeah, we were a little surprised to get these relatively old ages, but um, these are the ages that we got from the dating. So I, I can't really say any more than that. In the 12th century, early 12th, first half of the 12th century, we wrote it in Escandia for three reading data. Indicates very cold condition from about 11, 10, I think, to 1140 for something. Mm -hmm. First, really cold yeah. period. It's a little bit earlier than the Ice Age, but I mean, about 1100, really warm conditions in Sustopi in Escandia. Some slightly warm later here is not. It's around 1100, since the end of the really warm. Yeah. I think this was also, it was almost like 952 Calier BP, but we had to round it off to 1,000, so. <laughs> yeah, sorry, next speaker. <laughs>
what we call a marine-based ice sheet, so an ice sheet that is uh, grounded below sea level. And this is something we're very interested in today because we're very worried about what's going to happen with the West Antarctic ice sheet, for example, which is also a marine-based um, ice sheet. Okay, so I'm primarily going to be showing you seismic data. Um, so you get several different kinds of seismic data. You get uh, 2D seismic data, which are these, uh, you can see here, these cross profiles. These are crisscrossing across the North Sea Basin. You can get these very long profiles. And within the seismic data, we can um, map out or we can visualize our layers of rocks or sediments in this case. And you can see these different colored lines are just... Uh, uh, outlining the boundary between these individual uh, sedimentary layers. And then at a regional scale, sometimes we're able to, to join all these units up, essentially. And this is what you see a little bit here. Um, we can also collect 3D seismic. So here you see a 3D seismic cube. So rather than just having these uh, profiles, we can also look almost like map view going down uh, below the surface. And here you just see a 3D cube with the sea surface up here, a ship towing a, a 3D seismic system, which would normally be a, like a large air gun that bangs very loudly every five seconds. And then you have streamers with um, receivers on them. And we can also get 4D uh, seismic, where we do uh, repeat surveys over the same area to look at change over time. Okay, so I mentioned that the North Sea is actually a basin. Now it's a of course, quite a shallow sea, not much of it is, is, is deeper than about 100 meters. But at the beginning of the Quaternary, hopefully you get an impression here, it really was a deep basin. So imagine Scotland over here and Norway over here. And this deep basin was filled with, like I say, almost a kilometer worth of sediments. Most of these sediments are glacial marine or glacial sediments that have been pumped in at a very high rate as you've got build up and breakdown of large ice sheets um, both over the UK and over Scandinavia, but also at times, certainly during the mid to late uh, Pleistocene, where ice sheets have advanced right into the middle of the North Sea and deposited uh, sediments. And we have also several of these bore, well, these are boreholes here where we can sample the sediments, and sometimes we also have uh, wells as well. So these wells normally are drilled to about three kilometers. So we have this uh, nice record, both sedimentary and from the, from the seismic. The dates on this are very, very poorly constrained, but that's another talk, so I won't, I won't delve into that too much. Okay, so what was happening at the beginning of the uh, Quaternary two and a half million years ago in the North Sea Basin? So what you see here is, um, these are our, our time slices, so this is like map view, if you like, looking down uh, below the sea floor. So, of course, it's seismic, so it comes in two-way travel time. But I've, I've roughly estimated how uh, deep these, these, these time slices are. So for, here, for example, we're at 400 meters below the seafloor. Okay? So these are buried surfaces, if you like, very, you know, almost extending to half a kilometer below the seafloor. And what you can hopefully see are all these, like, scratch marks. And these are formed by ancient icebergs that were floating around in the North Sea at about two and a half million years ago, now buried by half a kilometer of sediment. So we know that during the early Pleistocene, there, was, there must have been ice in the vicinity of the North Sea Basin, very likely, certainly, ice within uh, the Norwegian fjords, large uh, icebergs uh, carving off and floating into the North Sea. And, and that's what you see there. But it's not only uh, icebergs or glaciers that are coming into the North Sea at this time. This is a very large uh, river system here. So again here, this is just the, this time slice, again, looking at map view, if you like, and hopefully you can see this very distinctive channel, which I've, uh, I've reconstructed the 3D surface here. This is a huge river system, buried river system. This is about three, 400 meters below the sea floor. Um, and it's big, you know, up, up to two and a half, uh, 250 meters deep, several kilometers wide in places. So this is a big river system right in the middle of the North Sea. So this area obviously used to be subaerial. You can also see a cross section of it here, just taken here somewhere, where you can see multiple downcutting events. So a very, very large river system, possibly relating to ice melting along the coast of uh, Norway as well. So I'm not going to mention too much about the sediments, but just 
Here I'll quickly mention, again, here we have our seismic, and you can see our different layers of sediment. Here is about, uh, this layer here is, a, is sort of around the base quaternary about two and a half million years ago. But this is a, is a well here, and we have several samples from the well. And uh, when we sample sediments as early, or right at the, the, the boundary between the Pliocene and the Pleistocene, we tend to get these, um, these uh, sand grains, these very weathered lithic grains, uh, these nice green glauconitic sand grains. These are all very local material from within the basin. But as we go into sort of uh, later material, material deposited around 2 million, 1 and a half million years, what one begins to see is very different where, um, rounded material and material that has a Scandinavian source. This is material that has been eroded off the Scandinavian mountains. It has been um, transported into the basin by ice, essentially. So as you go up through your stratigraphy, you begin to see this increasing glacial uh, signal. And that, that signal uh, correlates or represents this, these growing ice sheets on the neighboring uh, land masses. Okay, so what was the first uh, sort of glaciers to arrive in the North Sea? Well, here, if we look here along the Norwegian coast, so the first glaciers to come into the system will have, uh, would have uh, advanced down the Norwegian fjords, similar to like what you see here, and then spread out into the, into the North Sea. And we have seismic evidence for this. So if we look at this area just here in front of this large fjord, now, resolution's not great here, but again, we're looking at a, a map view, if you like. We're at uh, 200 meters or so below the seafloor. And what I hope you can see is this kind of spreading out, these lineations, these scrape marks, these kind of spreading out like this. And that's formed by a glacier essentially coming out of the fjord and then spreading out onto, into the North Sea Basin. So it would have looked possibly similar to you know, modern-day Greenland, something like that. So we would have had this Piedmont style of glaciation during the early Pleistocene. But the first evidence of a large ice sheet in the middle of the North Sea comes at about 1.2 million years. And again, time slice. Now we're at 250 meters below the seafloor, and you can see these mega-scale glacial lineations. These are lineations formed by large, fast-flowing glaciers, and this is in the middle of the North Sea. You also, incidentally, have another of this, this fluvial channel and even some iceberg scour marks here. So, um, and that happens about 1.2 million years, which happens to also be the mid-Pleistocene transition, which is a big transition in global climate. Uh, very quickly. Uh, okay, we also have something called tunnel valleys in the North Sea. These are subglacial meltwater channels, and you find them everywhere. These uh, grey marks show that you find them everywhere in the North Sea, also Denmark, North, uh, Northern Germany, similar to what you see here, but on a larger scale. This is what they look like in these seismic time slices. Uh, very distinct. Um, and I will just... Oops, skip. Yeah, that's more, that's more tunnel valleys. I mean, we don't have time to explain that too much. But I'll go straight to the conclusions. Um, so in conclusion, hopefully you've seen the potential of using uh, industry geophysical data to interpret various um, quaternary uh, climatic changes, depositional changes. Um, we have evidence of at least four or five advances of ice <coughs> into the North Sea during the quaternary. Um, tunnel valleys are very prevalent, this evidence of uh, subglacial meltwater. Looking to the future, there's now a lot of uh, research focused in the North Sea about uh, carbon capture and storage, because it's the site of, I think, the oldest carbon capture and storage project, um, and also decommissioning in the North Sea now, which is a huge challenge. Right. Yeah. Can I have one question? How long were these tunnel systems active? Can you say that based on the data? No. <laughs> no. So, and one, of the, and one of the questions, so you can see multiple generations of tunnel valleys. And the idea used to be that one generation of tunnel valleys, i.e. a set of tunnel valleys at the same stratigraphic level, would represent one ice sheet advance. But that's not necessarily the case, because tunnel valleys are formed in relation to hydraulic potential at the base of an ice sheet. And hydraulic potential is driven by the geometry of an ice sheet. And as an ice sheet grows and melts back, the geometry changes. Thus, it may form lots of different generations of tunnel valleys, even during one ice advance and retreat. Okay. 
Uh, did you say that there were traces of rivers, uh, something like three, four hundred meters down into the sediment? Yes. yes. So, so were they on land? Yeah. So at that at that how, how point, could, I mean, I mean, what does that? How does that? How can you explain that? I mean, what kind of sea level did you have then? Well, <laughs> that that's what we don't know at some point, other than to say it must have been uh, uh, subaerially exposed. So much of the southern North Sea, for much of the Quaternary, has been subaerially exposed. Today it's only about 20 meters deep, most of the southern North Sea. It's very, very shallow, 20, 40 meters deep. And, um, but the, the reason why it's, that's a difficult question to answer is because you have two forces at play. One, you have a very, very rapid infilling, which is causing uh, subsistence of the basin. But then you also have tectonic forces as well. So therefore, it's, it's, a, it's actually an ongoing project we now have. I'm involved in with uh, Bergen, Oslo, Lundin, Stout, and a few other people, where we look, we're trying to model that, looking at sea level or paleo water depth. Thank you. So now that's our latest day for the I five session. Thanks for all these four speakers and also for uh, this very active.